Patients commonly present to their GP with hand and wrist problems. So a basic knowledge of anatomy, physiology, and the ability to diagnose and treat common problems can be very useful. In a Dutch study of 8,000 men and women over 55, the prevalence of significant hand pain of all types was nearly 20%. The prompt and effective treatment of several of these causes of pain with joint and soft tissue injections can be rewarding for both doctor and patient. Don't forget that hand and wrist pathology can occur not just over the dorsum of the hand, where examination is commonly focused, but also within the palm of the hand, with the flexor tendons that can become inflamed and the carpal tunnel that can cause numbness and pain over the hand. It's useful to be able to describe accurately the joints of the hand and wrist. Shorthand abbreviations are commonly used to describe the CMC, the MCP, PIP and DIP joints in the hand, whilst most of us struggle to remember all the bones within the carpus and their anatomical order. If you are interested, here they are. And if you insist in trying to remember them, here they are from left to right with the proximal row first, then the distal row. Some lovers try positions that they cannot handle. Perhaps the commonest problem involving the hand and wrist, apart from OA and RA, is carpal tunnel syndrome. This involves trapping of the median nerve as it passes under the flexor retinaculum over the underside of the wrist. This commonly presents with nighttime pain and numbness within the distribution of the sensory nerves supplied by the median nerve. In cross-section, the carpal tunnel carries blood vessels, flexor tendons and nerves, and the first structure to complain when the carpal tunnel is put under increased pressure from a variety of causes is the median nerve. The sensitivity of a partially compressed nerve means that when the nerve is put under sustained increased pressure by flexing the wrist for a few seconds as in Phelan's test, this can reproduce the sensation of numbness. Carpal tunnel syndrome occurs more commonly with an underactive thyroid or in diabetics. It also occurs more commonly with certain repetitive activities such as excessive keyboard use and the hormone changes of pregnancy. Carpal tunnel syndrome does sometimes respond to injection. Studies have suggested that up to 60% of patients get significant relief for six months or more from a well-placed injection. Even severe carpal tunnel may well respond to injection, and most guidelines suggest that at least one steroid injection should be tried before surgery is considered. Now I'll show you how to do that. I'm now going to demonstrate injection of the carpal tunnel. This is a slightly uh, frightening injection for the patient because the patient's watching what you're going to do with the injection and it appears as though uh, you're stabbing the needle directly into the patient's wrist, uh, which indeed you are, but uh, this patient has been forewarned that it'll be a relatively pain-free and uh, relatively effective maneuver. I've also asked permission just to draw a few landmarks around the wrist for you. So what I'm going to do is just show you where this patient's carpal tunnel is as bordered by the bony landmarks. And you can see here that actually the carpal tunnel and the flexor retinaculum is quite a small area. Now there's a variety of techniques for injecting um, the carpal tunnel. Some people believe that if you get the patient to uh, flex the fingers and identify palmaris longus, which you can just about see here, then just on the radial side of palmaris longus, just towards the, this side of the carpal tunnel, you'd get directly into the carpal tunnel. In my experience, that runs quite close to where the median nerve is. So what I tend to do is inject further over to the ulna border. So I will identify where the ulna vessels are, which are right up against the side of the carpal tunnel. And then what I'll do is identify as close as possible to that side, missing any superficial veins, where exactly I'm going to inject, which is in the distal crease in the wrist and you can see it's not into the center of the uh, of the carpal tunnel and I think what you probably find is that the median nerve runs 
around there. So it looks a little bit like a, a railway map now, but um, that once we clean it up. So I'm going to use um, sterets again to clean the area. Nice wide area there, nice and clean. And then what I'm going to do is to use hydrocortisone acetate and a blue needle. Some people use an orange needle. Um, and again, a mill of 25 milligrams of hydrocortisone acetate and a mill of local anaesthetic. Um, just numb the area, not use local anaesthetic, but use ethyl chloride. And then my injection is going to go directly uh, perpendicular into the carpal tunnel, just over the area we've marked as we go down there and we get right down to the bottom of the carpal tunnel and then we can start to infiltrate into there and the whole liquid volume goes into the carpal tunnel and then once that's all done you've got to really uh, behave a little bit like one's done a blood gas and push very hard on the um, inside of the wrist so you don't actually get a hematoma and I'll usually push for a couple of minutes if injection fails, then surgery should be considered. Most surgeons will first want to see a nerve conduction study to ascertain both diagnosis and severity of carpal tunnel compression. Surgery through a scope has been trialled for carpal tunnel syndrome, but doesn't seem to work as well as open carpal tunnel release, which is shown here. Recovery is usually quick and uneventful. We'll next discuss two other common soft tissue problems in the hand and wrist, de Kervan's tenosynovitis and trigger finger. De Kervan's tenosynovitis, named after Fritz de Kervan, a Swiss surgeon who first described it in 1895, is inflammation affecting the tendon of the abductor pollicis brevis or the extensor pollicis longus. It presents as pain across the radial side of the wrist and lower forearm and it's the most common of the tendon conditions of the hand and is seen after pregnancy and also in people who use their wrists and arms excessively for computer use or other repetitive movements. Injection is indicated if the pain doesn't spontaneously recover and we will look at injection technique in a minute. Trigger finger is often seen in primary care diagnosed correctly and then referred to an orthopaedic surgeon who is likely to consider operation rather than injection. Injection when well performed with correct technique can work well and avoid an unnecessary operation. When a finger sticks in a flex position, especially overnight, it's likely to be due to inflammation of the flexor tendon as shown. Injection of hydrocortisone within the sheath of the tendon can reduce the inflammation and result in free movement of the finger within a short time. Now we'll look at injecting trigger finger and de Kervan's tenosynovitis. We're going to now look at injecting a de Kervan's tenosynovitis. The patient will complain of pain coming down from the thumb and across the radial side of the forearm. And what we're going to do is to first of all look at the anatomical site of injection and then look at the injection technique. Probably the easiest way to, to try and identify whether de Kervan's tenosynovitis is, is to get the patient to dorsiflex the thumb up against forced pressure and then ask where the pain is at its greatest, which in uh, this patient is just here. So then um, using a pen, I tend to mark down the line of the tendons, the abductor and the extensor tendons of the thumb. You now have a site uh, of injection. So using a, a blue 23 gauge needle and hydrocortisone acetate, because this is a soft tissue site, I, I get my blue needle and my syringe uh, loaded with a mixture of, of 25 milligrams of hydrocortisone acetate and one mil of 2% lignocaine without adrenaline, and then uh, clean up the site for injection. Some people use sterets, and it's perfectly reasonable with a uh, a tenosynovitis in a restricted area to use a couple of sterets to clean the area. Hopefully you won't clean off all the mark first. So if we clean all the way around that area so that we've got a nice clean no-touch site, ask the patient to put their thumb down and then using ethyl chloride give the area a, a nice spray. It's just going to be cold now that you'll feel on there. 
and spray from a few inches away for a few seconds and you can see there we've got a nice site uh, that's got a little bit of cold over it. And then what I'm going to do is just slide the needle alongside uh, the area of inflamed tendon just to the proximal side of the radial styloid. So the injection is just going to come in now and into there and then infiltrate with the solution all around the area of tendon sheath and that should be a very effective and relatively pain-free injection. Trigger finger is relatively easy to inject but relatively painful because the palm of the hand has a lot of sensory nerves as you might expect so uh, what you've got to do is warn the patient that this will be potentially slightly uncomfortable. So in the first instance you identify which is the triggering finger and, and, and in this gentleman it's the uh, ring finger that's been triggering so in order to get the, the landmarks you draw a line right the way down the flexor tendon and you're going to inject just into the side of that because if you go straight down and onto it you'll get into the tendon body and then not be able to inject the liquid. In this instance because there's quite a wide area I'll use a little bit of tricep and uh, or tight unicept on a bit of gauze and I'm going to clean up the whole area of the tendon sheath leaving the mark along the tendon and then use ethyl chloride spray and warning the patient to keep their hand nice and still insert the needle along the side of the mark so that it's in and along the tendon sheath and at that stage I can then infiltrate into the tendon sheath which swells up a little bit like a, a, a long tube or sausage uh, filled full of uh, hydrocortisone and local anaesthetic. When I finish the injection and all of the fluid has been uh, put into the tendon sheath I then press hard on the side and remove the needle and syringe and keep the pressure on so that the patient doesn't get a bruise on the palm of their hand and probably hold on for a minute or two. The commonest painful joint in the hand has got to be osteoarthritis of the carpometacarpal joint of the thumb. This occurs most commonly in postmenopausal women with nodal osteoarthritis of the hands. Whilst OA of the DIP joints forms Hebeden's nodes and in the PIP joints the nodes are called Bouchard's nodes, there is no specific name for osteoarthritis of the carpometacarpal joint. However, the carpometacarpal joint can become swollen and painful and the whole movement of the wrist becomes restricted as a result. The CMC joint can respond well to injection and it's worth knowing how to perform this as it can be easy, relatively pain-free and effective. Occasionally, if the CMC joint becomes too painful and unresponsive to injection, Orthopaedic surgeons can perform a trapezium removal to relieve pain. The wrist, a moderate sized synovial joint, can become inflamed in rheumatoid or in osteoarthritis when it can be affected by pseudogout crystals. Isolated wrist swelling is often seen in elderly, hospitalized patients after dehydration or infection and can easily be mistaken as an infected joint as the CRP and white cell count can go up as the joint gets inflamed. Sometimes this swelling is accompanied by an x-ray appearance of chondrocalcinosis of the wrist joint as seen in this x-ray. I'll now show you how to inject the carpometacarpal joint and the wrist joint. I'm now going to inject the carpometacarpal joint of the thumb. Um, I'm coming from this angle so that you can see it clearly on the camera but it's also an angle that I prefer because it's away from the patient rather than coming down and confronting. So um, first of all you need to identify where the actual joint is and do that by moving the thumb and you can feel down at the base of the thumb where the carpal metacarpal joint is just here and it's usually much more proximal further down the thumb than you think it's going to be. You think somehow it's going to be there. I've got that marked and I've got some um, cleaning fluid with some unicept here and I'm going to clean all the way around 
that area. Um, some people then use an orange needle and local anaesthetic to infiltrate down to the joint capsule. I'm going to use the ubiquitous ethyl chloride, cold spray coming. And then using a blue or an orange needle, in this case a blue needle, I'm going to introduce it and just feel my way gently down and into the, and just feel it go through the joint capsule there and then almost to the hub of the needle. And then what I can do is to start introducing the fluid and really put as much of the fluid in the syringe into the needle as I possibly can. When I've finished um, introducing the fluid, I'll then remove the needle out as quick as I can, press on the area at the base of the thumb to stop a bruise and then put a plaster on when we've finished. We're now going to look at the technique for injecting the wrist. I'll show you my technique and there are other techniques that are equally valid but this is the one I'm used to. First of all, to identify the ulnar styloid on the lateral border of the wrist and I'm just going to mark around it just to give you the landmarks. There's the styloid just there and then the joint line is just at the front of the styloid coming across and I'm going to um, inject just in that area. Now because the wrist is a relatively sensitive um, piece of skin I'm going to use an anaesthetic first to anaesthetize right down to the joint capsule then remove the needle and then I'm going to use a, a blue needle after anaesthetizing with an orange needle to introduce the uh, needle and the hydrocortisone. So clean up with normal saline unicept around the area and then it becomes no touch. And then using ethyl chloride as an initial spray just prior to the anaesthetic. Then I'm going to use an orange needle and lignocaine to infiltrate just on the lateral border there. So I'm going to do that right the way down, right the way down to the joint capsule. And that gives me a clear anaesthetized field to inject through. What I'll then do is re-clean the area, knowing that it's anaesthetized, and it, it will accept now a blue needle without too much squealing. And I'm going to inject down there through that anaesthetized area. Now I feel my way into the wrist joint itself, and just little, almost a feeling of um, giving way. And now I'm in the wrist there now. So you can see it's actually relatively pain-free with uh, the anaesthetic first. I'm going to start infiltrating the depamedrone, 80 milligrams, and local anaesthetic into the wrist. I'm just completing that now and just slightly withdrawing the needle and then as it's completed take the whole needle and syringe out and that's the injection of the wrist. I hope this brief review of hand and wrist problems has been helpful. If your diagnosis is accurate and you have a good injection technique, you'll be able to help many patients who present with hand pain.